Hey, it's the Sporting Tribune today, and if you're watching, what more do I need to say? The great Jim Lampley is joining us. He will be on the call, ppv.com, this weekend for Canelo versus Charlo. Jim, it's an absolute honor to get to talk to you. And I'll start off with this question. With your return, you've now become a story to the fight when you're used to telling the stories for all of us. How does this week feel? Well, uh, it's overwhelming to a large degree. I have been away from ringside for five years. I think a lot of people did not expect that uh, to happen, but it did. And uh, to be invited back by a new medium of communication, ppv.com, chance to engage in live chat and share with fans, as well as with uh, former LA Times boxing writer Lance Pugmire, in commenting about the fight in text uh, rather than in my voice. Tremendous opportunity. I expect it to be a lot of fun. Uh, and coming back into this environment, seeing all the boxing people whom I've missed so much over the course of the past five years, it's emotional, it's thrilling, it's fulfilling, and uh, whatever happens from this point forward, I will never forget what these few days in Vegas have been like for me. Well, listen, it's glad to be back. And I guess you could say the MGM Grand specifically where we're doing this was basically a second home for you. 100%. <laughs> second home for me and a second home for a whole lot of other people, too. Yes. And I, I have to ask, throughout this, um, this time that you were away, did you have a break period where you just stayed away from the game? Or was it a situation where if they would have asked you to call a fight a week later from when the HBO thing ended, you're like, I'm ready, I'm there, I got my stuff ready to go? I think the answer is both. Uh, I, I, I have watched the big fights. I probably haven't watched as many fights as continuously as used to be the case uh, back in the day when I was getting paid to, uh, to be as fully knowledgeable and expert as I could be. But, you know, if somebody, something happens like Terrence Crawford versus Errol Spence, I'm there. I have to see it. Uh, Fury versus Wilder, I'm there. I have to see it. And often with um, good friends from the whole sports uh, universe in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where I'm teaching at UNC and where a lot of my old friends who are basketball players and football players and coaches, et cetera, are all living there. So they invite me, come over, please come over and watch the fight at our house. Uh, they, they want the expert analysis for They want for me free. to talk about it. That's exactly <laughs> right. So, uh, so that has taken place several times and uh, it's always a lot of fun, and uh, recently I've probably watched a few more fights because I just had a kind of a vague kinetic sense that it wasn't, it wasn't all gone yet. I might get one more chance to do something, and here it is. When did, when did this become official? A couple of weeks ago, uh, a few weeks ago, and uh, I, I, I got a reach out not too long after Spence Crawford, and somebody explained to me, what ppv.com was. Because <laughs> I was like, what, were you and, hesitant and with the medium? And that ppv.com was going to talk to me and, you know, would you even be remotely interested in this? And, and I said yes for a particular reason, which is um, I think the nature of the content that I'm going to be delivering here is different from blow by blow. Uh, I'm not providing live captions to pictures. I'm providing perspective. I used to think uh, pretty frequently during the last few years that I was calling the fights on HBO that eventually it would make sense for me to get up and walk around Roy Jones's chair and go sit in Max's chair and for Max to get up and walk around Roy Jones's chair and come sit in my chair and for Max to take over and be the blow by blow younger more energetic more on top every day and for me to do the things that I had listened to Larry Merchant and then Max saying for years so this is more like that. This is uh, somewhat in that vein, and, and therefore, uh, in an odd way, I think I got what I wanted. And obviously there has to be, you, you just said it as, as we came into this interview, the nostalgia, and it's great to see people um, and, and see the family again, I guess you could put it. Is there a sense of nervousness to get back on the bicycle on Saturday? True, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I, I remember how nervous I was before I first started doing Blow by Blow for ABC back in 19... 86 and 87, and I had to learn my way uh, in. And uh, and now uh, I'm back, and I'm going to be at ringside in an environment where I have not been for four or five years. I've felt at home here in the media room. I've felt at home saying hello to all of the uh, 
reporters and broadcasters and uh, people like you whom I've known and dealt with over the years. I certainly felt at home yesterday interviewing both fighters, Canelo and Charlo, uh, and now I have to master feeling at home and authoritative and thoughtful and meaningful in communicating in a different way than before Saturday night at the fight. It's also a sense of like excitement to like tackle this and like not only get back to your passion, but this is a new this is a new obstacle that you're going to have to master, right? What if what if PPV.com? What if this kind of shared ringside chat becomes a significant force? Uh, a lot of people had questions way back at the beginning of HBO and Showtime. Are people going to buy this? Are they going to they going to hang on as a long term force in the sport, or is it going to go back to being on Wide World of Sports, CBS Sports Spectacular, and NBC Sports World? Well, the answer was change. The answer was evolution. And uh, and I think that this is a natural evolution in a world where a lot of people are now communicating on a keyboard the things that they used to say to somebody over a long distance telephone. And this is in the same vein as that. And you know, uh, one thing I do want to ask you if, if we could go back is, you know, to me, I couldn't believe that HBO said we're out of the boxing game. And when you get new owners, they can do whatever they want when they're the boss. 100%. It was new ownership that made that decision. And people ask me why, and I say, I don't know. I have no idea why they thought it was good to get rid of the boxing franchise. But it was their, it was their playpen at it, that time. Exactly. So that's and what they could do. And recently, another decision they made is Real World of Sports. Brian Gumbel no longer going to be on air and I know you played a big part in that show if you could talk about some of your favorite memories of doing that show I won uh, two Emmys I'm not sure maybe three I won two two Emmys for best sports reporting for stories that I did on uh, uh, real sports so I'm grateful to HBO and Bryant and everybody involved in the show for the chance I had to do those two stories and win those two statuettes that are now somewhere lost in a closet in Chapel Hill. Uh, and uh, and I, I interviewed a lot of interesting people. And I sometimes sat in the back of a limousine with the very great Frank DeFord, who was the most meaningful sports writer columnist uh, of his era at that time, and others who were reporters on the show. It was a great collaboration, uh, unique in my career. And I always thought of myself as a reporter and an editorialist, not just a showbiz guy. So Real Sports was a great outlet for that. And hopefully my research was correct in this next question. I'm a kid from Cleveland, Ohio, who spent way too much time listening to sports radio, WTAM in Cleveland, Ohio. I've heard that you were part of WFAN. Is that true? I was not just part of WFAN. I was the first on-air talk show host doing a sports talk segment for WFA in July 2, 1987. And I wrote an intro for that very first show, which was whimsical, comical, satirical in nature. And it was all about how uh, callers, Vinny from Queens in effect, would uh, orchestrate trades and, uh, and franchise transfers and things of that nature. And everything I wrote was, you know, this fantasy idea that, of course, would sound ridiculous and absurd, and all of it happened. Uh, and that, you know, that was a, a part of the evolution of the sports world that I might not have foreseen, but as I was in it and feeling it, uh, I certainly got it. And, you know, uh, at first people said, 24-hour sports talk radio, you're really pushing the envelope. That's not going to go anywhere. I said that first day, eventually there'll be two or three of these stations doing all jazz all the time in Salt Lake City. It happened. Uh, we got to the point in Los Angeles where you could listen to 24 hours of Kobe Bryant talk. No other subject. Yes. So uh, sports radio uh, was what it was and tremendously influential on generations of people who became sports fans. And you brought out WFA. And I was the first thing. guy to do a talk show in that medium. He said not only was I a part of the team, I'm the one who started the damn thing. And it's interesting because you brought up PPV, uh, pay-per-views. Same thing. Is this going to work? Here I am again. Sell out money? Here I, I'm, in a, I'm in another pioneer situation uh, and trying to help see whether a new medium can develop an audience bond. Yes, and, and again, Sporting Tribune today, Jim Lampley joining us. You can catch him Saturday night, Canelo versus Charlo, PPV.com. And before we get you out of here, I need to ask you about this fight. 
A lot of conversation about Charlo moving up two weight classes. To you, is that an advantage or a disadvantage for him? I think I'm leaning toward the idea that might help Charlo. Uh, I don't think this 14-pound weight jump is inappropriate for him. Uh, you watch them stand together. He's taller than Canelo. If, if you're looking for the frame over which you can most easily distribute 168 pounds, you can distribute it more easily over Charlo's frame uh, than yeah. over Canelo's frame. So uh, he hasn't fought at that weight, and I think it might be dangerous to get uh, too often into the vicinity of Canelo's counter left hook. Uh, he doesn't want to do that, but if he can make it into more of a high-activity boxing match, I think that might favor him. And uh, so I certainly don't rule out Charlo's chances uh, because of the 14-pound weight gap. I think it's a, a winnable fight for both fighters. It's a competitive matchup. It's what you want to see. But at, at the end of the day, uh, Canelo is a tremendously proud man, driven his whole career by massive ambitions. I think he wants to leave the sport as the greatest Mexican fighter of all time. And in order to achieve that identity, he's got to win tomorrow night. 100%. And our last question, I live here in Vegas. I have a dream of a fight at Allegiant Stadium, the new Raiders Stadium. Is there a super fight in this world that could fill up that stadium, in your opinion, right now? I suggested to Canelo Alvarez during an interview yesterday that um, in, in the world of fans and pundits, he's now no longer pound for pound number one because Terrence Crawford has seized that identity and put his stamp on it. Canelo said, I don't think so. He said, I am still pound for pound number one so you're talking about another weight gap this time it's 21 pounds uh, that will occasion if it happens a fascinating negotiation but barring some dramatic change that I don't foresee uh, or expect in the sport such as a Canelo loss tomorrow night uh, I think we're headed toward a pound for pound showdown between two historically great fighters Canelo Alvarez and Terrence Crawford it's going to take place at some weight between Canelo's 168 and Terrence's 147 and I can't wait to see it me and you both Jim it has been a pleasure and an honor to get to talk to you my friend thank you my privilege